It's a great pleasure to welcome everyone to the second day of the, the conference on the legacy of Ronald Dworkin and to introduce um, this distinguished panel that's given us three uh, subtle and uh, three three subtle and challenging papers on various dimensions of the work of of uh, of, of uh, Professor Dworkin. All three papers are, are critical, some more so than others. Um, I, uh, I, I, look forward, I look forward to them all. So the, the, the three speakers in, in order of uh, presentation are Professor Eduardo Rivera Lopez from the UTDT, uh, Professor Carlos Rosencrantz from, here from the, U, from, from, uh, from the UBA, and uh, Professor Martin Farrell, uh, also from the UBA. Um, we'll start with, with Professor Rivera Lopez. Okay, thank you. Well, thank you very much for inviting me and for this great conference, Marcelo. Uh, well, I, I want to share with you some thought about one issue that uh, Ronald Dworkin uh, discuss uh, in a very famous book uh, 20 years ago, Life Dominion, and afterwards in the so-called Philosopher's Brief. The argument is for the existence of a constitutional and moral right to active e euthanasia and medically assisted death. <laughs> <coughs> the discussion, as you surely know, took place around two legal cases, VACO and Washington versus Glucksberg. Dworkin and other leading philosophers wrote an amicus curiae defending the constitutional right to, medical, to medically assisted death, the so-called philosopher's brief. And other important uh, amicus written by the so-called bioethics professors, George Annas and others, defended the constitutionality of the state laws banning assisted suicide and active euthanasia. The discussion <coughs> and the legislation, in my view, has not changed much since then. Only a few jurisdictions have legalized active euthanasia or physician-assisted death in these last 20 years. What I want to do in this paper is the following. I want to convince you that the autonomy-based argument provided by Dworkin is insufficient, that we need a harm-based argument, that the traditional harm-based argument that many philosophers offer is also insufficient. And then I want to explore an idea that uh, probably a very crazy idea, but maybe not that physician-assisted death, or PAD as I will call it, is the fulfillment of a special obligation rather than merely a general duty to avoid harm. Let's go to the main argument by the philosophers in the philosopher's brief, Dworkin and other very important philosophers of that time. The first point is that there is a, and I quote Dworkin, very general moral and constitutional principle, namely that every competent person has the right to make momentous personal decisions which invoke fundamental religious or philosophical convictions about the life's value for himself. <clears throat> the decision about how and when to die is one of those fundamental decisions, therefore, it should be constitutionally protected in a liberal society. That, that would be the, the argument, very roughly. That means that <coughs> both PAD, physician-assisted death, and the refusal of treatment, or passive e euthanasia, including life support measures, are based on a right to autonomy. They are equally protected by the Constitution active euthanasia and passive euthanasia. There is one problem with this uh, argument, which has been by the philosophers themselves uh, showed in, in, the, uh, in the philosopher's brief, and is that in the case of the withdrawal of treatment, 
patients have a claim right to be removed from the life support machinery. Instead, in the case of physician-assisted death, patients have something weaker. They have a power to the fact that the state does not forbid PAD. Why the patient should not have a positive claim right to PAD and not just the power of not being legally prohibited from obtaining PAD by a willing doctor, as, as they say. After, after all, if in the context of the physician-patient relationship, the autonomy of the patient is the paramount value behind both passive euthanasia and active euthanasia, patients should have the same kind of right to both. One could answer to this, to this objection by considering the point and saying that patients also have uh, a claim right to be killed or to be assisted to death. But there is a, a second problem which is more important. Non-terminally ill, pa non ill patients, if they are competent, have a claim right to refuse treatment, including life-saving treatments. And we have many examples of, the, of this. Jehovah's Witnesses, uh, people with extreme anorexia who don't want to eat, uh, people with gangrene that have to be operated, and so on. And they refuse medical treatment, and we respect this refusal. If passive euthanasia, including removal of life support and PAD, are equivalent, as the philosophers say, when the patient is terminally ill, then non-terminally non -terminally ill patients should also have a right to PAD. That is, that doctors help them die insofar as they want to die and are competent. The autonomy of the patient should be respected regardless of the kind of behavior that this, in, that this entails. Moreover, if we accept that terminally ill patients have a claim right to PAD, as I said before, non-terminally ill patients should also have a claim right to be assisted to die, not just the power. Well, one answer is not, not th this one, is to concede the point that that is what I call in the paper the consistent liberal position, which uh, means that we should legalize and even say that there is a constitutional right to, uh, to uh, assisted death in healthy person or non-terminally ill uh, patients and uh, the legalization of killing on request. But I, I, I suppose this, that's not the right answer. And we can discuss that, that later, why I, I think so. And anyway, it's not the answer that Dworkin provides. They, Dworkin, in the philosopher brief, say, says that um, the prohibition of the assisted suicide and killing on request for healthy person and non-terminally ill patient can be defended as constitutional by saying that when the requester is healthy or is a non-terminally ill patient, being willing to die is usually irrational. Therefore, the legal prohibition is paternalistically justified to prevent people from being helped to die when that does not go in favor of their true interest. That's the, the expression of, of Dworkin, true interest. In the case of terminally ill patients, or some of them, that can be rational, and therefore physician-assisted death can go in favor of those interests. The problem with this answer is that the same reason applies to a competent, competent non-terminally ill, non ill patient who refuses a life-saving treatment. We should not allow such a refusal for the same paternalistic reasons. However, we do. We respect people who irrationally reject uh, treatment unless it is incompetent, but we do not help them die if they want. <clears throat> we do believe that patients at any stage of their illness have a right not to initiate or not to continue treatment, even if refusal goes against their true interest. Moreover, 
doctors are not only allowed but required to follow the patient desires to refuse treatment. So my provisional con con conclusion is that either we accept the right to be killed on request for everyone, the con liberal consistent uh, position, or we have to explain why non-terminally ill patients do not have a right to be killed or to be assisted to commit suicide. And terminally ill patients do have such a right. The explanation cannot be that dying is irrational in non-terminally ill patients because in that case we should also deny non-terminally ill patients the right to refuse life-saving treatments, which is also irrational. Therefore, autonomy reasons are insufficient to defend physician-assisted death. So we, uh, that's the, f the, the first part. Then I, I think that there is something that terminally ill patients in, in the very, very difficult condition in which they are uh, has beyond the autonomous decision to die. There, there is something there, there that, that is not in healthy person or non-terminally ill patient that explain why we accept or we can accept uh, physician-assisted death in terminally ill patient and not in other cases. And a harm-based argument uh, has have been provided by many philosophers. <coughs> and it uh, would be the following. For terminally ill patients who suffer from an incurable and debilitating disease accompanied by extreme physical and psychological suffering, the continuation of life itself can be considered, at least in some cases, a harm. What I call in the paper harmful life. Life is worse than death in, th in those cases. If life is an all things considered harm, PAD is not harmful, therefore PAD cannot be morally wrong. This is a, an argument provided by many philosophers, uh, Michael Tulley, Jeff McMahon and others. If, if killing is not a harm, it cannot be wrong, or at least it cannot be worse than letting die. Because killing is worse than letting die when killing is harming, but when killing is benefiting, it is not worse than letting a benefit uh, happen. So there is a problem with this, uh, with this argument that has been raised by Horacio Spector in, in a paper. And the, ar the, the, the problem is that the argument incorrectly assumed that killing is not harmful at all. Killing might be on balance not harmful or even beneficial, but it might at the same time be pro tanto harmful. And one can say that it's always pro tanto harmful. The moral reason against killing is a pro tanto reason and even in cases where the balance between harm and be benefit is that death is a benefit, all things considered, that reason may still work, the pro tanto reason at least from a deontological perspective, as a sufficient reason against killing. In fact, deontologists typically defend the moral prohibition of acts in way that <coughs> to act in ways that are all things considered beneficial. For example, it is true that deontologists believe that we cannot actively harm, for example, kill a person in order to achieve an overall benefit or prevent some more serious overall harm. For example, harming one to prevent more instances of the same harm in other persons. So the, the fact that all things considered that is a benefit or is not a harm does not say that this is not still not a pro tanto harm and therefore can be prohibited from the deontological perspective. However, it is more difficult to defend the position that it is impermissible to harm one person with her consent in order to prevent the same person from suffering a more serious harm. That's the way of arguing by Francis Kamm and others. So the ontologists are against actively harming in order to achieve an 
all things considered benefit when we are talking about different persons but when we are talking about the same person we can harm one person in order to to achieve an overall benefit in that very person in that same person still we might argue that the reason against killing is different from the reason against harming or is a special kind of harming there is a, a relative agent relative reason against killing and even if a terminally ill patient is in, uh, in a harmful life condition the pro tanto reason against killing against producing this special kind of harm might trump other reasons like relieving from suffering and doctors or medical ethics often argue in this way they say even if that is beneficial in some cases for the patient we doctor are not allowed to kill in any case we are not in the business of killing even if this is beneficial for for the patient so what i want to suggest in order to advance this argument or to to, to give more reasons in, in, uh, in the same direction is that it's the following argument which probably not very good one but and is that medical treatment in most cases not always but in most cases involve is involved in producing what I call harmful life Doctors are, in a way, responsible for this in the sense of being required to stop or to undo a harm to whose existence they have contributed. PAD is the only way to prevent or undo that harm. Therefore, terminally ill patients have a right to PAD. So the idea is that most cases of euthanasia <coughs> or people asking for euthanasia are cases of uh, patients suffering a long-term disease they have been treated but unfortunately uh, they fall in this very very hard condition what I call harmful life condition but this is also the consequence of the medical treatment and then medical profession cannot say okay I, I don't kill I, I have a relative reason an agent relative reason against killing I cannot do anything in that case because they are involved in that and I want to motivate this idea by looking at the structure of of the situation suppose well I would need perhaps a blackboard but uh, suppose that there are four states a b c and d and a is better than b b better than c and c better than d and for you <coughs> you are now in b which is a disease some disease uh, <coughs> and unless i act in some specific way x you will fall into c which is that i want to help you to avoid c to help you to remain in B at B or to go to A <coughs> and therefore I perform X unfortunately X in conjunction with your underlying condition and other factors cause your health to decline into D D is harmful life D is worse than death or worse than than C now you are at D I can perform an action Y that place you again, not against, uh, that I place you, that place you at C. Do I have the special obligation to perform Y if you consent that I do so? So the idea is that when we act in ways that trying to, to, to help someone, we create a harm, we, we have the obligation to undo that harm. So the conclusion, that's, a, that's just a suggestion that we can discuss. I, I resume my ideas in the, in the following way. <coughs> in a context in which we assume 
that the prohibition of assisted suicide and killing on request for non-terminally ill patients or healthy person is not objected as unconstitutional. The autonomy-based argument for defending physician-assisted death is insufficient. A harm-based argument is needed. Harm-based arguments have been provided by philosophers by claiming that death, in the circumstance of terminal illness, is not harm, all things considered, and dying can be, in those circumstances, a rational decision. I have defended the view that PAD, rather than a benefit, is a way of preventing or interrupting an ongoing harm, what I call, have called <coughs> harmful life. In cases of harmful life, the moral reason for killing with the consent of the patient conflict with the moral reason against killing, that, that the ontological constraint against killing. We may think that the reason against killing vanishes when killing is not harmful or prevent harm. However, since killing is always pro a kind of harm, we may always have a prevailing reason against killing. So ca how can we convince those people that they, they have to kill in that, in that c circumstance? My argument is that this cannot be right, at least when the person who kills, in this case the doctor, has been involved in creating the harmful life. In normal cases, in most cases, cancer patients, for example, doctors are not only allowed, but also required to carry out the request to die. Moreover, against medical, traditional medical ethics, providing physician-assisted death would be, in these cases, a genuine medical procedure. Thank you. Well, thank you for having me here today. Um, as you are surely aware of, uh, the question of uh, political obligation has remained a great puzzle for political philosopher throughout history. In, in justice uh, for Hedgehog, so Dworkin makes a very insightful observation. And he says that um, our travel to find an uh, plausible explanation for the force of the law throughout the history of political thought is in part due to a wrong start. He says that we were captured uh, by the metaphor that we live in a pre-political world, and if we theorize concern with how to justify the passage from a pol pre-political world to the restrictions imposed by law and society, we would, we would need not only a justification but one that works for each one of those uh, involved, an, an individualist justification, an individual, individualist justification, so to speak. Unanimity then emerged as a necessity. Dworkin is aware that the metaphor um, is somehow misleading. How surprising move for a liberal like himself, he starts looking into the area of associative obligation, or as he sometimes calls them, uh, obligations of fraternity. Dworkin offers two clear cases uh, of association that source obligations, uh, friendship and family. Both friends and members of the family are bound together um, just by virtue of the special concern that each one of them has to show for each other in the reciprocal interactions. Now, Dworkin thinks the law is a source of moral obligation when, because and if, the law could be seen as the rules enacted by political communities where its members display to one another universal sense of reciprocal personal concern and this is the critical part, for the equal well-being of everyone else. Dworkin certainly has not been alone, nor has been he the first one in defending political obligation as instances of associative obligations. 
But for legal philosophers at least, he's the most interesting one because he intertwines very intimately the theory of legal obligation he was trying to elucidate with the concept of law itself. When asking the question about whether law binds, most political philosophers assume that they are asking something quite different from the question of what the law is. Precisely the reverse happens with legal philosophers. The, the divide between these two questions, what the law is and why the law binds, seems to rest comfortably upon the commonsensical conviction that unless we find, we first have a grasp on what something is, we would not be able to meaningfully ask whether that something provides autonomous reasons for action. Dworkin has radically, and in my view correctly, challenged this approach. His method denies that our conceptual scheme could be shaped entirely either by semantics or fixed solely by empirical facts. In his view, our practical concepts, morality, law, community, democracy, and so on, are mainly normative and not fully grasped and understood unless we embark through a constructive thought process that takes as one ingredient the defining facts of the practices which morality, law, community, and democracy in essence consist, but also includes clear and molding references to the array of values each one of these practices aims to instantiate. I, I highlight here the connection between legal and political theory in Dworkin's thought not because I find it problematic, uh, on the contrary, I think it's a quite right move. But just to emphasize the importance that for Dworkin has the way in which he defends the general obligation to abide by the law and the impact uh, on his overall view that this defense would have if somehow proven defective, as I think it is. The particular kind of associative defense of political obligation Dworkin offers which ties the binding power of law and its very existence as such to a community of citizens that takes an interest in each other's well-being that is sufficiently special, personal, and egalitarian, has merits. Dworkin's theory is both uh, sufficiently general, so, I, so as to explain why everybody in a political community, and not only law officials or those that have consented it, uh, have the obligation to abide by law, and it's sufficiently particular as to explain why members and only members of a political community whose law is an expression thereof should do so. However, beyond its merits, there, there is a fatal objection, I think. The working theory cannot, that the working theory cannot meet. More precisely, it's over demandingness. Suppose a country where two different religious groups of roughly the same size but with totally different conceptions of the good cohabit in the same territory. Suppose that both groups get convinced that the realization of the different conceptions of the good will be likelier if they live peacefully together. Suppose now that one group manages to impose a view that takes a morally wrong decision that impacts in the distribution of resources, but that can be easily ignored by most citizens uh, without much consequence. Disobedience, for instance, will remain hidden and nobody will discover it nor imitate it. Should the law be complied with? Is there an obligation to abide by the law in these circumstances according to Dworkin? I think Dworkin has to answer my question in a negative since the community of my example is not what he would call a community of principle, its, its citizens do not display an interest in the equal well-being of all, the law cannot request general submission to it. Certainly, a community of principle is a great thing to have. In a community of principle, we would most likely develop the inner, inner social resources required to live harmoniously, even when the law be sometimes ignored. Our interests in each other's well-being would most likely produce enough respect, gratitude, 
and in general social cohesion to bridge the confrontations the community may have. On the other hand, the prospects of, of the law forfeiting the, its authority for not being an egalitarian enough will not necessarily be damaging. But in the community of my example, where cohabitation is rather the product of a kind of truce, and there is a deep cleavage uh, between members of both groups that prevents them from seeing each other as members of a family or a more inclusive group, an authoritative legal system seems to be the only instrument left to organize a mutually beneficial common life. Dworkin's theory due to its demand that equality be realized or at least aspire to um, before the law could gain authority qua law seems to strengthen the force of the law but unfortunately where the law is close to redundant. <coughs> And it undermines said force in all those, those circumstances, for instance, the kind of example I was talking about, where precisely it's more acutely needed to bring social cohesion and other goods. This is perplexing. And perplexity in, in, in here suggests that something is wrong with Dworkin's approach. Let me mention that uh, the way in which uh, equality figures in, Dwarf's, in Dworkin's political theory is somehow surprising because he was very aware of the problem of our demandingness. Indeed, Dworkin explicitly recognized that a community of principles should not be confused with a perfectly well-ordered moral community that sacrificed, I'm sorry, that satisfies justice as fairness in a full and comprehensive way. He knows only too well that, to organ that to otherwise the theory he would offer would be unable to explain, as he wants to, why actual citizens of many political communities did have a moral obligation to abide by the law. <clears throat> but why, in spite of being fully aware of the dangers of being too ambitious, he fell victim of it? Dworkin thought that it was overall appropriate uh, to condition political legitimacy of a particular community to the community commitment to the realization of equality in the dimension of well-being seems to have been caused by his conviction that all associative obligations are conceptually egalitarian. This rings to be true. However, the egalitarian character of association able to source obligation to their members does not certainly imply that the appropriate dimension of equality is the same one for all kinds of associations. Among family members and friends, for instance, it seems to be the case that well-being is the right metric to measure whether there is enough reciprocity to grant obligations. But the situation is different with political communities. A political community could exist as such instantiate their intrinsic values and thereby source a general obligation to abide by the law even when its members were not really interested in the equal well-being of all, provided that everybody is actually treated with all the privileges and rights of the members of the community in question. At any event, my, my conjecture is that the real determinant behind Dworkin's strategy was different than his appreciation of equality. He was much more interested in defending integrity and the particular conception of the law he wanted to offer, there is where the jurisprudential debat debate was, and his, this interest moved him to go too far in the design of the conditions that political communities were subject to in order to gain authority for the legal systems. For Dworkin, integrity was law intrinsic and idiosyncratic virtue. In his view, to honor integrity, we not only need to accept consistency, but further, we need to accept that the political rights and duties of members of the community are not exhausted by the partial decisions that political communities have reached, and also that government speaks with one voice in a principle and coherent manner, uh, and uh, uh, the community treats it, its citizens 
according to the substantive standards of justice and fairness it uses for some. Integrity demands members of the community to be concerned by each for all, to be a concern by each for all that is sufficiently special, Dworkin says, personal, pervasive, and egalitarian. I think a political community could exist as such, instantiate the intrinsic virtues, and thereby source a general obligation to abide by the law, even if, it's, if it does not realize or aspires to a quality of well-being. Provided that, as I suggested, everybody is actually treated with all the privileges and rights of the members of the community in question. It's obviously debatable what is required for someone to count as an equal member of a political community, but one thing is clear, that it should be determined by our conception of political community, which doesn't seem to include a quality of well-being into it. If you conceive a, com a political community as an association of those subject uh, to the same system of coercion, aspiring, aspiring to jointly mold a common destiny for mutual benefit, and to help the realization of everyone's conception of the good, you may have found the substance to resist Dworkin's claim that the authoritative that the authority of law be conditioned to the realization of the quality in the dimension of well-being. If membership and not well-being is the dimension of a quality appropriate for a political community, and obviously this is a big if, the law could gain authority even when the community fails to satisfy Dworkin's test. I, I've been assuming that an associative explanation of the authority of law will be sound and convincing, but we still have to display a powerful criticism that affects Dworkin and all other associative theorists. Two, I have been skipping so far that a criticism that affects all associative explanations. You may charge Dworkin's theory of being tribal and incapable of providing a universal justification of its views. Indeed, for an associative theory of political obligation to be sustainable, you need to show that the association of citizens that abide by the law qua law, even when this is neither fair nor just, serves intrinsic values, which not only could not be attained in any other way, but that could also be defended by universal reasons. Is this criticism correct? Dworkin obviously had a prompt response. Actually, he has two responses. <coughs> In Justice for Hedgehogs, uh, Dworkin claimed that dignity is the core interpretative value of life. Dworkin argues that under certain conditions, the value of dignity not only does not prevent, but on the contrary, requires submission to the law qua law. More precisely, when the state treats all those it governs with equal concern for their well-being. Under these conditions, abiding by the law, by abiding by the law, I do not violate dignity, because we can view the political association we're member thereof as a collective enterprise in which myself and others partake as equal members. On the contrary, if I disobey the law, Dworkin says, I would immediately violate the dignity of my fellow citizens, treating them without due consideration for their self-respect and authenticity. Dignity, Dworkin argues, could then be presented as the universal value that law-bindingness serves. Dignity is obviously an important personal value, However, in my view, it's not the value that may sustain associative explanations of the authority of law. It's not clear to me how could we claim that the dignity of all is actually honored, and therefore that the obligation to abide by the law is sustained in the acid circumstances where our political associations violate the dictates of justice and fairness. In addition, and this is more important for me, the idea that dignity is the value that ultimately justifies the restrictions that law imposes upon us seems to share the same sting that Dworkin said affected the theories that aim to explain political obligation as if we lived in a pre-political state. Dignity, 
as the theorists model out of the metaphor of a pre-political state, is too individualistic, and as such incapable of explaining how a non-ideal legal decision that may affect some will be no th notwithstanding required to be accepted by all because it's the law. In, in Law's Empire, uh, Dworkin says something altogether different, which appeals to non-individualistic values that I much rather prefer. He suggested there, though in a very incidental way, that a particular association between law-abiding citizens that aims for integrity serves the value of organic change. Dworkin did not take the time and the energy to spell out with great detail what he meant by the idea of organic change. However, I think it's not very difficult to provide an elucidation of this expression that could make an associative explanation universally acceptable. Indeed, organic change could be seen as the ability of a community to make progress in the process of realization of the values the community has aimed to serve without ceasing to be the very same community throughout that process. Thus presented, organic change is irreducible to other values, especially so irreducible to justice or fairness. Therefore, it's non-instrumental. Further, it's a universal value in the sense that it could be endorsed by everybody, whatever his or, his pers or her personal circumstances of moral convictions. And finally, it's a communal value in the sense that it's not a value for us individually consider, but on the contrary, a value of the community and as, and as valuable, valuable as the community is. To fi finalize in the 20 seconds I have, uh, let me reconnect briefly with uh, what I said uh, in previous sections. I've suggested that to explain why we had to abide by the local law in societies less closely knitted than the ideal of the community of principle, Dworkin or the Orkinians would need to soften their over-demandingness of their associati uh, associative views, abdicating of the aspiration that only widespread concern for the equal being of all founds the existence of political obligations. I have also claimed that Dworkin correctly correlates his theory of political obligation to his theory of law, to such an extent that questions of when the law binds and questions of what the law is are answered by twin responses that are nothing but chapters of the same overall theory. In light of these correlations, all changes to be incorporated in Dworkin's theory of political obligation will require mirror changes in the theory of law. If integrity and its egalitarian impulse is too demanding a requirement to have at the moment of conceiving a theory of political obligation, it should also be regarded as too demanding at the moment of conceiving a theory of law. Let me clarify here a point which I think is very important. Of course integrity, like fairness and justice, is a virtue whose realization would make a legal system better as such that is better as a legal system. But the question here is not which is a better legal system or whether integrity is a virtue, but rather what counts as law or whether integrity could be conceived as a constitutive virtue of law. That is to say, as a sine qua non condition, something which are without which law ceases to be, which therefore requires every judge and every law official in every jurisdiction to enforce it. If integrity cannot occupy the role of the constitutive virtue of law, the competing conceptions of law Dworkin argues against may recuperate visibility and consequence. For instance, what Dworkin calls soft conventionalism, a theory of law that conceives as law the rules negotiated and sanctioned through the formal process of lawmaking and its underlying principles, which requires judges to respect the requirements of consistency across time and subjects it to conception which should, uh, should be carefully reconsidered. Remember here that Dworkin's most cherished, uh, most uh, wanted argument against self-conventionalism is that it allows checkerboard statutes. And checkerboard statutes are not to be accepted for being inimitable to integrity. Self-conventionalism fits pretty well with a membership theory of political obligation, as one could call the one I imply in my comments here, that claims that we should abide by the law of our community 
when we are full members thereof. Indeed, self-conventionalism is a feasible conception in a non-utopian world of people most not dominated, not dominantly motivated by the realization of the quality of all, but still committed to respect the full membership of all to a community decided to live together for the common benefit and their laws of their collective making. Thank you. And finally, Professor Farrell, who will be speaking about Dworkin's obsession with unity. Thank you for inviting me. There is a recurrent trait in Dworkin's work that has not received the attention it deserves and which consists of his obsession with unity. When two concepts, principles or values, for instance, are expected to clash, and that clash could potentially disturb Dworkin's theory on an issue, he usually recurs to the same tactic, to deny the clash by sustaining that his supposedly colliding concepts, principles or values, are in actuality one in the same. Therefore, of course, the clash is rendered inconceivable. Without claiming to have achieved a comprehensive list, I have identified three instances of this technique that I will address chronologically. A, the attempt to equate liberty to equality. B, the attempt to equate ethics to metha-ethics. And C, the attempt to equate law to morality. Liberty and equality. Dworkin identifies two possible strategies for reconciling liberty with equality. One is interest-based, while the other is constitutive, i.e. defining. The constitutive strategy incorporates liberty from its inception into the structure of equality itself, because liberty appears in the sheer definition of the ideal distribution. However, the constitutive strategy immediately faces a serious risk since the harmony between liberty and equality is obtained by definition and is, therefore, purely analytical and even circular. Dworkin sees this difficulty and sets out to build an argument that supports this definition. The argument in question begins by eliciting the concept of equality which demands equal consideration to all. From this starting point, Dworkin aims to conclude that the best conception that can result from such a concept is that of equality of resources obtained by way of auctioning of every available good, which is, of course, the method he employs. In order to bridge the concept itself with his own conception of it, Dworkin resorts firstly to a principle that he refers to as the principle of abstraction, which establishes a strong presumption in favor of freedom of choice. The principle of abstraction is perfectly feasible, especially for a liberal. Before using our resources to purchase the auctioned goods, we must first know what we will be able to do with them. The less we can do with them, the less valuable they are to us. Although the principle of abstraction establishes a legal presumption in favor of freedom of choice, that choice obviously cannot include unconcerned harm to others, from which the principle of security follows, which prohibits such harm. Up to this point, Dworkin's idea seems feasible. The first challenge, however, arises immediately after that, in the form of another principle that limits the principle of abstraction, and which is known as the principle of correction. Let us suppose that I bought land at Dworkin's auction and set out to build a house on that land. Even though all my neighbors build traditional houses, I decide instead to build a modern square glass house. Because there is a generalized consensus among my neighbors that I am single-handedly ruining the neighborhood, 
the auctioneer has taken the precaution of prohibiting these rapid houses. There is nothing wrong with the goal of contributing to the existence of a homogeneous neighborhood, of course, but it's hard to understand the principle of correction in any terms other than a restriction of my freedom. Also, the personality of agents is not fixed, and their convictions and preferences are subject to change, and these changes must be accessible and protected, this time under the principle of authenticity. To I do not deem the principle itself objectionable, its scope is far too broad, considering that it covers everything from religious freedom to freedom of expression. Furthermore, this is all there is to say about principles, because Dworkin believes that the auction requires prior protection of individuals who are subject to systematic prejudice and suffer serious disadvantages as a result of that prejudice. The tax, this tax goes to the principle of independence. But nothing more could be expected because liberty and equality are two different things and uniting them in a single definition would <coughs> undoubtedly lead to counterintuitive results. Equality requires a minimum of liberty which is contained in the initial version of the principle of obstruction, but its extension and accessories are clearly ad hoc. It is a miraculous coincidence that the auction leads precisely to each liberty which which Dworkin is concerned. We start out of an auction and miraculously end up at the liberal state. This attempt is reminiscent of the efforts of some political thinkers of deriving a series of rights from the notion of democracy, instead of admitting that democracy is simply a majority rule and that the rights they crave to protect are liberal rights, whereby what they should defend is not democracy itself, but liberal democracy. It would be fortunate for liberty and equality to be the same value because if they were, we would be able to subject them to the maximization strategy. But it is not the case. If in the real world I must pay a tax that decreases my income and wealth, I may not be able to challenge it in terms of equality, but I may be able to challenge it on the basis that it affects my freedom to choose my life plan. If liberty means, to some extent, being able to do what we like, and if there are people who do not wish to be like other people in certain respects, then equality is incompatible with the kind of liberty in question. I am not implying, of course, that equality should not prevail in the conflict. What I am saying is that there is a conflict. Apparently, in this case, the fox saw it much more clearly than the hedgehog. Ethics and Metaethics. Let's suppose someone told you that there is not such a thing as meta-language that is independent from language. When you inquire further, you are told that meta-language cannot be different from language because it is subject to the words of national language. This would be a terrible argument, of course, because you could respond that the same words can be used in different ways, sometimes to speak about the world, and at others to speak about language itself. Let us suppose now that someone told you there is not such thing as mathematics, because it cannot help but use mathematical concepts, such as numbers. This is also a very bad argument, because what myth and mathematic does, for example, is discuss the nature of numbers with perspectives as dissimilar as those of Plato and Bertrand Russell. Claiming that the above is identical to Dworkin arguments with regards to the relationships between ethics and metaethics implies caricaturizing the argument, however. Since notwithstanding, is it not all that different? Because, as we will see, it consists of saying that in order to speak of morality, we must resort to moral judgments. 
Let's suppose that John says abortion is immoral and this statement is objectively true. While Peter says that abortion is immoral and that statement is an expression of his feelings. According to Dworkin, John's ethics are different from Peter's because they have both clarified and emphasized their judgments differently. This is odd, however, because they are both expressing the exact same ethical view on abortion, saying they both, they both deem it immoral. Perhaps it would be far less odd to sustain that John and Peter hold the same ethical view, but different meta-ethical views. Dworkin believes that the notion that there are moral properties in the universe predicates that certain actions truly are unjust, and that some people truly are good, and that all this equates to an internal moral proposition. This sounds also odd, because it is odd. If I claim that John is a good person because he possesses the property X, Y, and Z, I'm making an internal moral proposition. However, if I add that there are facts in the universe with which this proposition can be constructed, that is not an internal moral proposition, but rather a proposition about morality. The working mistake could be the following. He believes that the statement, the proposition that abortion is wrong, correlates to a fact, is just another way of saying that abortion is bad. This seems to me to reproduce Tarek's view that the proposition Snow is white is true if and only if Snow is indeed white. But in actuality, however, Tarek is sustaining something radically different from Borken. Tarek is, constrant, is constructing the proposition with something that exceeds its scope, i.e. with reality. The first part of his statement is expressed through meta language and the second through language. This is precisely what Dworkin is trying to avoid doing with respect to ethics and meta ethics. <coughs> but, someone, but someone could object that because I am focusing on the 1996 work, I have left out Dworkin's main argument against the possibility of mythetics in justice for hedgehogs. What argument is that? Hume's principle, which Dworkin describes as follows. No series of propositions about how the world is, a scientific or metaphysical fact, can succeed as an argument in itself with regards to a conclusion about what it should be without resorting to a value judgment that is hidden in its gaps. Dworkin claims that this principle seems evident and true, and I could agree with him. But what is the scope of the principle? When Hume claims that an ought cannot be derived from an is in a single case, what he has in mind is deductive reasoning. Meta-ethics is certainly not a case of deductive reasoning, which is why the principle <coughs> does not apply. Why would Hume have questioned the possibility of describing a normative system via proposition describing what is, compose a proposition of what ought to be? Legal sciences, that is, all the time. Mythetics, in conclusion, seems to continue to enjoy good health. Law and morality. Ideological positivism is a doctrine that flourished in ancient times and which sustained that morality is part of law as a subset of the law. Nothing could be deemed moral if it was not first part of the law. Creon was an ideological positivist. Hence, while he was personally perplexed as Antigone refused to obey his orders and the moral grounds, how could anything that was contrary to the law be moral, wondered Creon. The last of ideological positivists, Thomas Hobbes, defended the same ideas in the 17th century. After Hobbes, however, it is difficult to find an ideological positivist. It makes sense that there will be none, 
because the doctrine prevents morality from carrying out its function of evaluating and impacting on the law. If anything contained in a legal norm is thereby moral, then the 1935 Nuremberg Law laws are moral. Whether these laws were indeed laws has been and continues to be the subject of much discussion. However, the, the only ones to ever sustain that they were moral were the Nazi leaders themselves. Nevertheless, this would be an inevitable conclusion if one adhered to ideological positivism. But why ideological positivism disappeared in the 17th century, in the 21st century, its outside appeared. Ideological moralism, which sustains that the law is part of morality and not independent of it. Who could defend this odd theory? Somebody who was obsessed with unity, of course, or a law. Know how radical this proposal is from its very inception, not to a law theorist, but a classical or contemporary, defending the idea that the content of the law must be consistent with the content of morality. But more than this national law version, take this a step farther by sustaining the law is part of morality, that the law is a subset of morality. <coughs> now, <coughs> one claims as a much true law of political morality as a branch of subdivision of it. To differentiate it from the rest of political morality, Dworkin resorts to the phenomenon of institutionalization, which he views as characteristic of societies with separation of powers. This, at the same time, leads him to differentiate between two kinds of political rights, legislative and legal. The former are non-enforceable rights which need to wait a turn until the whims of politics determine that it is their time to be fulfilled, while the latter are enforceable rights and one can resort to the justice system for their fulfillment. Legal rights are political rights of a special kind, as they can be enforced at the request of interest parties. I have no problem with the distinction between enforceable rights and non-enforceable rights, but I do not believe it requires eliminating the distinction between law and morality. So, I am unable to see how this relates to the connection between law and morality. If we view the law as a branch of political morality, then we immediately face the need to differentiate it between legal rights and other political rights. And this is where Dworkin faces a difficulty that he fails to overcome. He takes two examples and points out differences between them that nonetheless do not seem to merit different solutions. The law of fugitive slaves in US and the Nazi edicts. In the first case, the US Congress issued, before the Civil War, a law forcing officials in free states to return fugitive slaves to their owners. What are officials to do in such cases? Did judges have the political obligation to rule in favor of slave owners? On the one hand, the US Congress was a legitimate political institution which went in favor of slave owners. On the other hand, there was a moral argument in favor of human rights. From a moral point of view, Dworkin believes that the law should not have been enforced. But how should this solution be posed in legal terms? Dworkin offered two alternatives. The first was to sustain that the law affecting fugitive slave was valid, but far too unjust to be enforced. The second consists of saying that the law was far too unjust to be valid. Dworkin professed the first alternative, sustaining that judges face a moral dilemma when enforcing the laws on fugitive slaves. But is morality is part of the law. How it is possible from a valid norm within the system to be, at the same time, morally unjust? In Dworkin's second case, the Nazi edicts, 
he believes such edicts did not even create prima facie rights because the Nazi regime was completely illegitimate. Therefore, the edicts were not law and judges faced not moral dilemma before such edicts, just prudential ones. But in this case, the law's supposed membership to the scope of morality plays no role in differentiating between these two examples, since the law pertaining to fugitive slave was as immoral as that of the Nazi edits. What does play a role in differentiating between them is something else. Whether the norm in question is part of a system that is generally viewed as just, the United States, or generally viewed as unjust, the Nazi Germany. And by the way, Morgan does not alas what the Nazi edicts were, given that he believes that they were not law. <coughs> Conclusion. What does it all mean? First and foremost, it means that all three attempts at unity are wrong. Let's begin with the distinction between liberty and equality. It would be very convenient for them to constitute the same value because then the maximization strategy would be applicable. Dworkin questioned whether equality is a value. But isn't liberty subject to the same question? I believe it is absolutely conceivable for someone to pose claims in the name of liberty without mentioning equality in such claims. It is perfectly legitimate to view liberty as an intrinsic value, i.e. a value in itself, while Dworkin, in the best of cases, reduces this to an instrumental value, an instrument for enforcing the quality of resources obtained through the auction. The result is discouraging for liberals. Let us look <coughs> at the distinction between ethics and meta ethics. Utilitarianism holds as a supreme principle, for example, that happiness is the only value, and this is undoubtedly an ethical statement. But how can this be principle be described? Benham viewed it as subjective, while Mill viewed it as objective. This discrepancy cannot be interpreted as occurring within the scope of ethics because they were both defending the same principle. In addition, men have viewed it as an analytical principle and Mill as a synthetic and empirical one. Therefore, the discrepancy cannot, for the same reason expressed before, be interpreted as a discussion on an ethical plane. The reason is simple. They are both mythoethical discussions. Throughout his entire career, Dworkin always assumed, without battering much to prove it, that these values were objective. Authors who questioned objectivism, such as John Mackey, for example, posed a challenge for him, one that he set out drastically eliminate by eliminating mythoetic as a discipline. This was a radical move for which he failed to provide solid arguments. <coughs> Let us conclude with the distinction between law and morality. Dworkin was, from the beginning, a natural law theorist. Back then, the sworn enemy of legal positivism, which he identified with heart, as he was unfamiliar with the work of Hans Kelsen. With his third attempt at unity, he achieves a dreamed goal. If law is part of morality, then natural law is not only true, but analytically true, while positivism is contradictory. What a convenient result. However, we are obliged to be skeptical. If law is a subset of morality, then we necessarily have to ask, which morality? The ontological or consequentialist, for example, or taking an analytical stance and assuming that metaethics really exists. Objective or subjective? And if law is a subset of political morality, we necessarily have to ask, which political philosophy? Marxist, liberal, communitarian, or feminist, for example. Justice for hedgehogs says nothing with regards to this issue and many others. I must confess I felt a bit uncomfortable 
while writing this paper and having to tell you what you already know, that liberty is not equality, that ethics is not mythetics, and the law is not morality. Why then waste both your time and my own? My excuse is that the great philosopher with very sophisticated arguments claimed the contrary, but those arguments were also implausible and counterintuitive, and thus needed clarification. Therefore, I would like to think that all of this has been more than mere waste of time. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you very much. Um, before opening up the floor to questions, I'll, I'll, uh, I'll start by asking a, a few questions of my own to each of the, um, to each of the speakers. Um, so, Eduardo, I'll start with you. Um, so you appeal to this principle uh, that says that if I harm you despite my intention to benefit you, um, I have an obligation to restore you to the situation uh, you'd have been in if I um, if I had not intervened, um, and you appeal to this principle in order to explain the um, the claim right, it's actually quite strong. It produces a claim right uh, for physician-assisted um, for PAD, um, as you call it. Now, uh, two very brief questions on the, about this principle, just by way of elucidation. Um, so, in your view, does it or should it make a difference as whether the treatment that aimed at the better state? was ordered at the behest of the patient. To put the point another way, couldn't a doctor who, uh, who, who is subject to the obligation on your, uh, on, according to your principle, uh, couldn't he say that he was merely the instrumentality of the will of the patient who ordered the treatment, who requested the treatment that he provided? So say in your can cancer example, uh, certain, uh, certain, certain treatments to 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 cure uh, to to attempt to cure the cancer. Um, so second brief question is that you, in your paper, recognize that patients might fall into harmful conditions spontaneously by way of accident, um, or by having uh, been treated by other doctors, um, doctors other than the doctors who they request the PAD from. Um, you answer. Uh, you answer that without, uh, without intervention, people normally die as a result of illness and it's medicine uh, that saves and prolongs lives. But I don't quite see how this meets the, the, third part of the, the, the third part of the objection that you yourself raised, namely the question about how do we deal with the fact that, it's other do that the doctor who performed the treatment is not the same. And presumably your answer, it's implicit in your paper, is that the obligation falls on the medical community as a whole and therefore any member of the medical community who's asked is required to uh, perform the physician-assisted uh, PAD. And my question is whether or not this is dis this is a this is true of all professions, so to speak, or whether there's something about the medical community in particular that binds them so closely, such that the obligation attaches to the community um, at large. Does it apply to the legal profession, for instance? And if so, um, if so, how? Um, so, uh, uh, moving on, uh, uh, Carlos, you you uh, you talk both about. Uh, uh, Dworkin's treatment of political obligation in uh, in Law's Empire, as well as his later treatment in, in Hedgehogs. Um, the, as I see it, although Dworkin doesn't distinguish uh, sharply, doesn't say that he's changing his mind, as I see it, uh, and as I think implicit in your treatment, the views he offers are, are different. The account of the associative obligation um, is different. And, I'm interested in your treatment of the justice for hedgehogs. So, so uh, as I see it, Dworkin there, Dworkin and Justice for Hedgehogs. This is roughly his account. He says we uh, we find ourselves in associations that we cannot avoid, namely common submission to a coercive government. We all need uh, and can't avoid uh, a coercive. Uh, uh, to, to be governed by a coercive body, but that, uh, that condition exposes us to vulnerabilities that are consistent with self-respect only if they are reciprocal and only if they include the responsibility of each to accept the collect collective decisions as binding. Um, so that's, that's roughly the view. I have my own questions about this view, uh, but, 
but I wanted to, to turn briefly to your your problem. So as I saw it, you had two objections to, to Dworkin's view in Justice for Hedgehogs. One was that it didn't treat sufficiently um, the, uh, it, it didn't explain how uh, an unjust, uh, uh, an imperfect uh, state, an imperfect but legitimate state that didn't satisfy fully uh, uh, requirements of justice could nevertheless um, uh, produce uh, binding obligations on its citizens. Uh, you, you, could, you didn't see how this is consistent with its principle. Um, uh, because uh, because you didn't see how this is consistent with a principle that appeals um, uh, to dignity. You um, you also have an objection that it's it's too individualistic and not sufficiently communitarian. And it's and instead you propose a, a, a principle of organic change. Um, and I would just invite you to, to elucidate more more fully uh, what that principle is, what what exactly needs to be satisfied in order for a society that realizes organic change to uh, have its its print have its uh, have its uh, law uh, genu genuinely binding. But I'm specifically interested in how it how the your principle of organic change escapes the very charge that you. Um, made against work and specifically how does it treat uh, societies that are not uh, perfectly uh, just presumably those societies too can realize uh, the, the can realize organic change and and therefore you too would seem to be exposed to the very problem that you um, that you raised for for Dworkin's account, um, uh, and finally, Martine, uh, characteristically, perhaps in the manner of a fox, you uh, treated piecemeal three. You criticized in a piecemeal fashion three of the um, three of Dworkin's unifying efforts, um, and I would just uh, rather than engage. Uh, in detail with any of them, I would just simply invite you to reflect uh, generally on what might Dworkin or others have found attractive about this unifying impulse, and why, wh what might be attractive about it, what are the costs of avoiding it, and how might we resist whatever attraction um, it evidently had, at least to Dworkin. Are you going to collect many uh, many questions or? Ah, or obey your answer. <laughs> Am I going to to answer you first? Ah, okay. Sorry, I, I thought. Okay, I think. Uh, your uh, three points are, are very very good ones. Um, concerning the first one, uh, that um, doctors and patients could arrange different kind of contracts or, or um, uh, consent in different kind of, of uh, physician uh, patient relationships, and the point would be if a doctor could say a patient okay I treat you but I don't do that or, or, or this uh, and my answer would be that uh, medicine is a very very regulated activity it uh, a, a doctor cannot do anything that he or she uh, contract with, with a patient. For example, I cannot go to a, to a doctor and say, I want you to cut my, my arm because I, I want to. Uh, a, a doctor would not do that, uh, even with my consent. And uh, therefore, I think that a doctor could not say, uh, if the medical community say says that that some kind of of treatment is required and i think uh, physician assisted that should be included within the 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 practices that a doctor should do uh, it doesn't seem to me that the, that a doctor could say no, or, unless for reasons that uh, conscious uh, objection that that would be a, a, the, the reason but not that i i can contract with my patient that I don't do that. Uh, it seems to me, but I, I should think about that more. Uh, 
uh, <coughs> well, the cases that uh, patients who, who fall or ill persons who fall in, in the harmful life condition spontaneously is obviously a problem for me, for, for my argument, but I think most most patients uh, uh, are treated by medicine uh, by uh, and a long time. Uh, for example, in 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 Netherlands, uh, about 80 percent of people asking for active euthanasia are cancer patients who have been treated for a long time and who have died if the treatment would not uh, have taken place. Um, uh, of course, I, I would say that those cases in which uh, a person fall in an in a such a condition, for example, as a con uh, as a uh, in in war or as a consequence of an accident, and uh, it is normally so that that the the medicine first saved the the life of that person and then. Uh, Treat that person in order to to cure. It is not. It is very very unlikely the, the situation in which the person is is dying in the field of of the battle. In that case, I would say that maybe we can kill that person for mercy reason. But it it I wouldn't say that that, that this is a, a medical act action. And of course, uh, uh, regarding your third point, uh, the, the medical community acting as a whole, as a, as a, I think that should be the case. The, I, I'm, I'm, I defend that uh, not only the medical community but also the legal community should be much more uh, unified in a, in a set of rules and standards and they should be responsible also for what other doctors d does, do. Uh, of course, th this is very controversial, but uh, I think I have to say that. <laughs> Thank you. Let me let me let me clarify something first. Uh, you have to explain why um, a, a communal explanation of the obligation to abide by the law uh, is a reasonable one, and and in that explanation, you had to provide for the value that is somehow uh, served by the community itself. You could say communal explanations are not good at all, but that's not Dworkin's point. Dworkin's point, he believes in a communal explanation. My, my argument against Dworkin is that when he wants to provide what is the value that the community uh, instantiates, he resorts in justice of Hedgecott uh, uh, to a too individualistic value. And, and there is, my claim is that it's really difficult to see how you could claim both, that you had to oblige by the law when the law imposes an unfair or an unjust uh, decision uh, and at the same time serve dignity with that. Um, unless you mean by dignity something different than Dworkin actually means. The only way out is to you know, to resort to a communal value. And, and he actually does so in, just in Los Empire when he very incidentally refers to organic change. That's a communal value because organic change, dignity is a value for each one of us. Organic change is not a value for each one of us. It's a, it's a communal value. 
Now the question is, is it valuable at all? First, what does it mean? What organic change is? And second, is it valuable at all? He doesn't say much about this. I think, I think we could elucidate its meaning, and I think it's a valuable virtue, so to speak. Um, and I think in, in uh, organic change is sort of the intrinsic value of political association, and it's the value that allows, it's the value that a community that is able to change incrementally in its search for the goods or values it wants to instantiate, but at the same time remains remains being the same community. Um, it, it's a uh, Dworkin has this uh, wonderful also metaphor that says that the community that that, that uh, satisfies integrity uh, and I would say co you know organic change expands and contracts organically. That that's the idea, and that seems to be what we are, what we what we see as worthwhile having uh, when we're thinking about why we should abide by the law, because it's not the satisfaction of fairness or justice, not even dignity. It, the, the dignity explanation is problematic, and and it's perplexing. I mean, it's, it's curious in the sense that it's uh, his his. Uh, He's going back to the individualistic uh, explanation that he wanted to circumvent when he said, hey, listen, think about the associative uh, explanations of uh, obligations. And when we think about friendship, it will be perverse to think that uh, we had to abide by the obligations friendship creates because it's good for each one of us. We don't think that way. We think friendship is a good thing to have. It's obviously, in some indirect way, it has to be good for us. But it's not good because it good, it, it's, it's good for us individually speaking. It's, it's good because it's collectively good. You made a very interesting question, Jed. You reconstruct the paper as a, an essay in inductive reasoning. Case one is a failure, case two is a failure, case three is a failure. Well, what's the conclusion? The conclusion is the unity of value is a failure and you ask, well, what is the cost of the conclusion? The unity of value is the main tenet, uh, raison d'etre of uh, Joseph von Hedgewax. It appears in the first sentence of the book, and it flows in every page of it. So the only cause that I can foresee is that justice for Hexers would not have been written. But I don't like the book. There's no cause to <coughs> Thank you. You're, I, I don't know your name, Pila. My question is to Carlos. Um, we may think that your conception of political community is too spacious, too um, inclusive, and that the correlated political obligations too broad, over demanding, unless we take into account uh, that which kind of reasons according to, the, to your view, legal norms provide. And you said uh, several years ago that the kind of reasons legal uh, norms provide are potent reasons for action. And since then, my question is, uh, which weight um, legal norms as, pro as potent reasons for action you think have, uh, which are the reasons that uh, can defeat uh, legal reasons. And my second question is, I'm curious about, um, since you are, you reaffirm your commitment with working approach about the correlation between the theory of law and political obligation, in what, in what sense you can find sympathetic Lewis a Lewis proposal. I really don't understand. Okay, let, let me start by the second by the second question. 
one way to conceive what, was, what I was trying to do is I was trying to help Lewis because I think he's uh, <laughs> Because I think he's right if eliminativism is understood this way and not as a reductivist uh, approach to the normativity in general. And that's what my question yesterday was, you know, there are two senses in which you could be an eliminativist. Uh, if you believe that no, the question that dominates is the practical question, what should we do? Then the concept of law, it's like, you know, it's a shortcut, uh, but, but it's, not the, it's not an interesting thing. It's, it's somehow uh, the question of what the law is is dominated by when the law binds. And, and that may change for different agents. You know, it's different if you're a judge, or a lay person, a bureaucrat, it's different. And that, that, that's what I think Lewis was after. A second way to present what I was trying to do was an argument against uh, Marcelo uh, and against the court when it refers to roles as a matter of law. I think that's a big mistake. Uh, I think uh, law is something different. I mean, we may strive for justice, but, but law does not necessarily include as a matter of concept, so to speak. Um, is such an uh, aspiring uh, conception of justice that the world is. Let me go to the first, uh, and, then, and then I was trying also to, because I'm also sympathetic to what uh, Marisa said. Uh, my, my, my only point is that it, you had to phrase the defense in terms, in communal terms. You can you can put it in uh, cooperative terms because you, you don't capture what is captured when you talk about the community and the ability of the community to sustain itself as such, sustain itself and change as such. The questions, the, the first question is a, is a very difficult question. Is this, and it depends on many different things. Uh, it's true. I believe legal reasons are only pro tanto, or they are not necessarily dominant reasons. And it may vary. It's it's weight depending on who you are. If you're a judge or a lay person or a bureaucrat or a foreigner, it, it may vary. Um, and uh, and this sort of the weight legal reasons provide in an all considered judgment depends a lot on the kind of community you're talking about. And that's a very problematic thing. Because, uh, and this is what I, I think I will take a, a route that is completely, um, how could I put it, um, surprising. Because I think when the law, when the community you are a member of, it, it's a great community, it's a community of principle, law is less binding. It's much more binding when your community really needs law in order to constitute itself. And that's perplexing. It's, it's sort of the reverse of what working thought. And, and, and why so? Because there's where we want law more. We need it more acutely. Uh, in, in, in Argentina, in the States, you could pay the price of disobeying here and there. I think in Argentina you can't because we disobey all the time, not only here and there. So you have to be categorical. And, and, and the reason law provides should be stronger than in different uh, latitudes and circumstances. Sam is at a question. Underlying all three papers is a very troubling question about the nature of legal change. And Martin has a view that law is not morality, so creating the moral conditions does not obligate the result in law. Uh, Carlos speaks of uh, incremental organic change, of a communitarian sense of when the law is prepared to move and the response to other sets of institutional forces. So to um, go back to the philosopher's brief to question something about its assumed conception of how law changes. The thrust of the philosopher's brief is we the following have concluded as a matter of moral philosophy that the following position should stand. And the implication was therefore it should be read into constitutional law by the Supreme Court 
court, even in the face of this being a contestable proposition, even within the philosophical community, within the medical community, within the states of the United States. And I think the conception of legal change that the brief assumed was actually inferior to the position by the not noted philosopher named Chief Justice Rehnquist in the actual opinion in Glucksburg. Because what Rehnquist said is, we may get there. And substantive due process in our constitutional order provides the means to get there. But it requires a degree of institutional settlement that we, the court, are unable to perform on our own. So Rehnquist examined the history of assisted suicide in Netherlands. He looked at the political movements in the states of Washington and Oregon on this question and said it was too soon for the law to lock in this effect. Um, it's the same methodology that the Supreme Court will likely follow in the uh, same-sex marriage cases uh, later this year. Um, it seems to me that this is a missing step in Ronnie's theory, the translation, the actual translation mechanism from morality to law, and that the, in some ways his physicians, his uh, assisted suicide brief highlighted the weakness of it, I think for the reasons that uh, Martin and, and Carlos are, are trying to identify here. decision by the Supreme Court of Canada shows the same because many years ago they, s they said that uh, assisted death was unconstitutional, was uh, the prohibition of assisted death was constitutional and this year they reversed that decision. So it, it, it was a process and they say now we are ready to do that, not before. I interpret Sam as saying that we must discuss the relations between law and morality. I'm willing to discuss the relations of law and morality conceived as two different, different systems. I'm against about the conflation of law and morality, but the relation of both is in law scrutinizing, examining, controlling morality and vice versa, morality controlling law and especially willing to do that. Which I, I'm against the, the fashion of identifying law and morality, fashion which begin with justice for hedgehogs and continues nowadays with Mark Greenberg's about moral impact theory of law and Scott Hershkovich's and I'm against that time, that conflation, but I'm totally, totally willing to examine the relation of law and morality. <coughs> Okay. Yeah, I think, uh, I mean, I think one of the problematic uh, influences that Dworkin had in all of us, especially in the third world, is that it, it requires us to be too grandiose somehow. Um, you know, you go too, f too fast and too much to morality, uh, and you forget about sort of the structure you need to make your society change organically. Um, and there are plenty of examples here. We are extremely grandiose in the paper, but then we are completely unable to actually change. And I think, in part, we are responsible for that because we have been too seduced by, you know, the the, the beautiful way in which Dworkin argues. Uh, we've been convinced, uh, without paying any attention to the institutional setting, you need to realize justice. Lewis. So I have a question for Eduardo and one for Carlos. My question for Eduardo is basically a restatement of Jed's first question to you in a slightly more decision theoretic context. So uh, at the time the patient consents to treatment, right, the treat treatment is an uncertain action. And sometimes it has good effects and sometimes it has bad effects. And um, uh, so I find it a, a little 
a little odd, but maybe not to, to describe when the bad state is realized, that is the treatment is ineffective and has these uh, side, or has these side effects. So it, it, it seems a little odd to say that the uh, doctor has caused the harm in the right way. That is, he didn't intend to cause the harm, certainly. He intended this treatment, and this treatment would either have the good outcome or the bad outcome or some outcome in between. And so now it's a little unclear how, why I should jump or make, reach the conclusion that you're reaching, which is that it's a harm that needs to be repaired by the actor, uh, by the doctor. And similarly, you might say, well, your answer is really all I'm doing is I'm changing the, the, the payoffs in some sense for uh, bad outcomes. Right, so, uh, so your proposal just says, in the event of a bad outcome, the patient has an option to elect C instead of having D. And um, that, that's okay, right? So what, but arguably that would have an effect on, say, doctors' willingnesses to offer treatments, right? So if they don't want their pose, they don't want to, uh, to give C, treat for C, when, should the patient elect it, they may be less willing to propose the treatment in general, and that might be a bad outcome. Okay, so that's my question for you. Um, so for Carlos, uh, uh, this is arguably a point of clarification. So um, your example of the two communities really suggests that um, your, one of your problems with Dworkin is that in some sense he's too demanding and that we need a theory of um, the obligation to obey the law. The obligation to obey the law should somehow attach uh, in less, uh, for less uh, compelling reasons. And I guess the question is why, right? So why, why is that necessary? Why, you know, I mean, so currently people are, the, the trend is for people to say, well, people don't have a general obligation to obey the law, okay? And uh, it doesn't seem, it's not clear that that conclusion about what the people's moral obligations are is having a large, is, has a adverse consequence, say, on development. Uh, sorry, I, I think my, my answer would not be very <laughs> satisfying because I, I know that th there is a problem. Um, but it seems to me that it's not so odd to think that even if uh, if the harm is not intended, even if it's, it's a side effect of the intention to help and to improve the health of, of the patient, um, you have, or the doctor has a, a, a an obligation to repair those side of kind of harmful side effects. For example, if a, if a doctor forgets an instrument inside uh, the body of the of the patient in an operation, uh, uh, although he he has the the best intentions to 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 help the patient, they they have to 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 repair, to undo, or to. Uh, solve that problem and, and make a, again a, a new operation in order to remove that so so it's it seems to me that the, the basic idea w would be that if if, uh, uh, if if life is a harm and and in some way the the medical treatment was involved in that kind of harm they cannot look to the other side they, they cannot say i have nothing to do with that they they should 
do something to, to repair that. And in some cases, the only way to solve that problem is debt. That, that would be the intuitive about it, but I understand your, your point. I, I cannot say more than that. Okay. Um, I think that the way to think about uh, the problem of, of, of uh, bindingness um, it's different from the one suggested by Dworkin. I think you have to start, if you think that, and this is a big if, that there, there are communal values, so to speak. And th this is a big if, but, but I do think they are communal values. Then I think you'd be better off if you provide a theory of uh, legal obligation by a way of providing a theory of membership to a political or legal community. So, there are communal obligations. It's like, friendship is good, then provide me a theory of one, someone is a friend of someone else. That will be, I think, the general structure. Your second point, I mean, people actually do not think, I wouldn't say people, I was, uh, law professors think, uh, you know, the law doesn't bind at all. Um, <laughs> so, and you know, that nothing changes, so why don't you write about something different? <laughs> You know, my real motivation is Argentina. I think you had, you had two important facts, and these are facts here. First, this is not a well-organized community. And second, there is a rampant and general attitude of disrespect to the law. And everybody refers to someone else's violation of the law to justify his own. That's the way we work. So you need a categorical argument, sort of uh, to bootstrap us. <coughs> and it has to be categorical. And the arguments you may invoke in the states, for instance, to abide by the law, doesn't work here. Because again, too many people disobey much of the time. So since you are forced to provide a categorical argument, I think it's a good idea to explore the theory of membership. Assuming that political communities are something good to have because they serve good values. And the most important one is the ability to, again, change as a community while remain being so. But that, that's the motivation. It's, uh, it's, it's about Argentina. It's like, uh, it is like a war and peace. It's about Russia. This is about Argentina. So <laughs> it's not mentioned here. but. Uh, <coughs> But war and peace is about the war, also. <laughs> not only, Jacob, not only about Jacob Weinreb over here. So, Eduardo, I was wondering if you would clarify the relation between the harm-based aspects of your argument and what you say about autonomy early on in the presentation. So, Jed and Lewis asked about the significance of the patient consenting to treatment that has an uncertain outcome and how that conditions the doctor's subsequent responsibility. And so I want to ask you about consent, not in that instance, but in the final instance, uh, in which you say the, the patient has to consent to the, um, the killing. And that seems, of course, completely reasonable, but I actually don't see how it follows from your account. So I take it that you want to reject the autonomy-based argument and impose or formulate a harm-based argument. And the master principle of the harm-based argument that you offer is, if killing is not a harm, it cannot be a wrong. Now this is a master principle that makes no reference to the idea of consent. So I actually don't understand um, how you're entitled to the idea of consent if that's the principle from which your argument proceeds. I was also wondering if you have a view about how the jurisdictions that lack this theoretical argument were able to um, shed themselves of prohibitions against physician-assisted death, given that you think this argument is necessary to create um, the kind of political and uh, law reform um, required. And in particular, um, 
might it be that jurisdictions that have implemented this reform actually have within their constitutional jurisprudence a very powerful argument that is perhaps um, uh, more powerful than the ones philosophers have formulated? Okay, thank you. Um, yes, maybe I have to reformulate some uh, some uh, parts of the of the harm argument. Uh, of course, um, uh, all philosophers who, who defend that kind of argument say, also say that that autonomy is a necessary condition. It's not sufficient because uh, even for benefits, we we require the consent of the benefit person. We cannot do anything without the consent of the of of the patient, even benefiting patients. So uh, uh, I. I I think uh, maybe the, the formulation of the, of the argument was not very happy because I say if it's not a harm, it cannot be wrong. And there are o other conditions. It, it was for simplicity. Uh, but of course, a every medical procedure uh, has to, to have the consent of the patient. Uh, the, the other question is much more difficult for me because I'm a philosopher. I, I, don't, I don't have any idea how this kind of argument could provide reason to a legal uh, reform. Uh, I, I'm inclined to think that, that the constitutional argument uh, is, very, is very difficult and it's much more likely to, to have an ordinary legal change. In, in or, or a, a law providing this kind of, of <laughs> legalization and not a constitutional right via uh, judges, but that that's only uh, uh, the opinion of a non-legal expert. <laughs> Counterexample. Yeah. To um, uh, assist patients in this way rather than as a criminal prohibition that was struck down yeah. on the basis of constitutional Yes. Uh, okay. Maybe. All right. Um, next up is Marcelo. Um, uh, I have a, a comment for Eduardo and another for Martin. Eduardo, um, um, I, I would like to ask you whether a Dworkinian strategy um, would uh, maybe change some of your conclusions, help you change some of your conclusions. A Dworkinian strategy, by that I mean uh, an attempt uh, not to um, understand autonomy and harm as you know opposing values and try to uh, the same value yeah <laughs> if they are val if they are values they are the same value of course um, to to uh, const construct construe um, in them um, in the light of the other. So, for example, um, autonomy is not um, the, the right to do whatever you want. Um, and, and, they are so, uh, and therefore, uh, s some conducts, for, for example, harmful conducts, would restrict your, your notion of uh, autonomy. So, for example, the person still is um, self-harm. Self -harm. So the, pers the person's autonomy still would include the right to self-harm, but would not include the right to have other persons involved in an irrational action. Okay. Uh, on the other hand, um, a Dworkinian approach to the value of preventing harm 
uh, would be different from the one that doctors usually uh, use. Um, they, they, they tend to be paternalistic and they tend to define harm without any uh, regard uh, to the will of the patient. Mm -hmm. So a Dworkinian approach to harm would also consider a harm uh, going against the autonomy, the autonomy of uh, the patient. So maybe, yeah. well, that, that's the comment. And then, uh, do you want him to respond? And then, when you finish your, when you do yeah, uh, to Martin. Um, in your in your uh, paper, you do not provide. Uh, enough examples to show what would be the advantage of uh, taking your pluralist view uh, as different from the from Dworkin's view. Uh, the few examples you provide are really, I don't think they are successful. You um, one example about um, an alleged conflict between uh, freedom and equality is the example of this neighborhood where uh, the, 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 the neighbors do not want a certain type of, uh, of style um, in building houses. And you uh, present that as a restriction of, of your freedom, which it, it's okay, but um, it's the, the, the um, requirement or, or the restriction is not serving here the value of equality. So it has nothing to do with the example of the conflict between equality and freedom. Uh, it may be an aesthetic value or something of the sort, but this is not an, a good example of um, a conflict between um, freedom and equality. Um, you give, you give uh, when, when speaking about, against um, Dworkin's ethical uh, view, um, you give another example. Um, Peter says that abortion is immoral um, and that that statement is an expression of his feelings. Um, and another person says that uh, abortion is immoral and that is objectively true and uh, you say they are say, uh, saying the same thing. That is obvious, obviously not so. Um, I, I have these uh, discussions with Paola all the time. She asks me to close the window and I say we are in the middle of the summer, it's uh, 35 degrees, it's hot. I didn't say, she responds, I didn't say it's cold, I feel cold. So it's perfectly different to say that something feels like being immoral and that to affirm that it is immoral. Um, so I, again, I, I think um, the, the lack of examples um, makes your, your, your presentation um, or your proposal less appealing than it would be. I mean, we, it would be helpful to know what is the advantage of abandoning uh, this that you call an obsession with unity, which I would say it's not an obsession because it's not irrational. It's a, a reasonable attempt um, to find consistency and coherence across different uh, do uh, theoretical domains. Um, why isn't better to be obsessed with unity than being obsessed with incoherence? Try to keep it brief. Yes, yes. Uh, well, I, I will have to be brief because uh, I don't want, I don't know what to say. But anyway, um, the problem with with uh, your point is, I think that how we explain that we respect autonomous decisions to to self harm in cases where uh, persons reject medical treatment. For example, the cases of the Jehovah's Witnesses. The, uh, they we, ca we could say that uh, by rejecting the blood transfusion 
or they or, or being operated they are harming themselves and irrationally however unless they are incompetent or uh, infant or, or whatever if they are competent we respect that decision but if they would like to be killed well then uh, okay but then uh, what what I say is that uh, something more than autonomy <laughs> is doing the work uh, in order to explain this kind of asymmetry not only autonomy because if autonomy in the sense of having the right to make fundamental decisions about our own life would be the only value uh, <coughs> working in, in, the, in that case, then we should either accept both things or reject both things. Uh, and this is the, the reason why I, I think there is something connected with, with the, 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 our belief that it is not the same killing someone actively than letting a, a person die. We, we, we let uh, Jehovah's Witness die when we don't treat them. And there are many other, other examples. But we don't kill them when they want to be killed because of the same religious reasons. You are right, Marcelo, and we need more examples about this subject. Let's begin with uh, law and morality. We need uh, the morality to control the law in some cases, and law to control morality in other cases. For instance, if the law is horrible from the moral point of view, you could question the obligation to obey the law. And if we have some behavior terribly immoral, but just immoral, we could arrive at the result that it's too dangerous to leave it to morality alone. And we could say, Let's make it a crime. So it's, of, it's useful to have morality on the one hand and the law on the other, to control each other. Concerning ethic and meta ethics, we want to discuss the nature of values because it has empirical significance in our daily life. For instance, if values are subjective, we could be tolerant about discrepant behavior. But if values are objective, tolerance has not much place in public life. We must not be tolerant with a mistake. So cognitive genetics could signify the end or a serious limitations to tolerance. Concerning liberty and equality, Dworkin begins with equality and then added principle after principle, including all types of liberty, every type of liberty inside equality. All liberalism inside equality. So liberty is no more an intrinsic value, an independent value. And that could be, in a way, uncomfortable. Suppose that in the 18th century, Dworkin was participating in the French Revolution. And he is in a committee with uh, Danton, Marat, and Robespierre, for instance. And he is in charge of designing the motto of the revolution to be put in the flag. If Dworkin designed the motto, the motto would have said, equality of resources through an auction and fraternity. And something would have been lost. Don't you think so? We have, we have two more questions. We're going to ask them both in, in, in succession before, and then we'll, we'll, we'll answer all at once since time is short. Um, Marissa and then Roberto Salva. Well I, uh, well, I have questions for um, all, th all three of you, but well, maybe I'm going to focus on, on uh, Carlos' position. Um, 
Uh, well, uh, my problem with this idea of organic change is that, well, I think that is you have not explained why uh, what this means, no? Because, well, um, the relevant question for me is, well, what is the the value uh, of uh, a community to keep alive being the same community? Uh, maybe if we think that a community is like an organism, no? like in the med medieval times, no? saying, well, this is an alive uh, organism with a life uh, uh, of its own, and well, we can understand uh, uh, its pretension of survival. Okay? But without this assumption, it seems that the survival uh, of the community as it is, um, uh, if it's separated from the members of the community, uh, the community, I, I, sorry, uh, if we, we, we are not seeing the community as a separate entity, then we have to ask, well, uh, what is the, the importance for the members of the community, uh, the survival of this community? And the importance is or instrumental importance for them in order to ask them to contribute or to the value chain. Uh, there is one intrinsic value here. But where is the intrinsic value of the community? And, 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 I, and I haven't understood uh, uh, what is this, this value. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and I have a, another question for, for Martin. Um, uh, and it's uh, around uh, the last criticism you are doing. Uh, working on the relationship with the law of morality. Well, um, here we would say, uh, do you accept uh, the idea of a special morality or not? Uh, is it possible to understand that there are associative obligations uh, that uh, come from and special morality that are distinct and that can clash for other kinds of uh, obligations or moral duties, general duties, for example. If it is possible to accept that the idea of a special morality, well, we can understand uh, that there is no dilemma in saying that even when law is part of morality, is a distinct part of morality, and then it could be morally unjust from the perspective of general morality, for example. If, if law is shaped by certain kind of values, a mix uh, between formal and uh, substantive values, we can say that uh, maybe that something that is um, um, correct from the internal morality of law, maybe it's going to clash with other um, the, uh, um, demands of justice, of general justice. I don't see the problem if we assume no, the, the idea of a special morality. Uh, now Roberto. Very brief to Carlos. Um, I, I was almost uh, persuaded by your um, uh, communitarian approach uh, and I think it was mainly because of the example you put of this uh, society composed by two uh, radical uh, or, or two groups to, uh, with radical disagreements on, on values. But then when you answer to Lewis you said what I guessed that the whole paper was motivated by the Argentinian uh, case. And the Argentinian case doesn't seem to me uh, a similar case to this, uh, the, 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 the hypothetical you presented of these 50-50 radicalized groups. So, um, I don't know, I, uh, I'm puzzled by, by your answer to Luis. Final words. Why almost? <laughs> okay, Marisa. Um, I mean, you you could have the view that uh, that the only values that there are are values for each of us individually considered, right? And if you have that view, I don't think I could convince 
that organic change uh, is something interesting to think about. But I will assume that you don't think that is the right approach. Uh, your only problem is that you don't understand what organic change is about. Let's think first about what a political community is. A political community is a very special kind of community. It's not a family, it's not a, a, it's not a friendship. Uh, we we think political communities are the, by the byproduct of a realization that in community it's easier for all, not necessarily for each of us individually considered, but for all to realize conceptions of the good. We can we cannot live by ourselves. It will be much much more difficult. That's why we have communities. And the second. I think very important and defining aspect of a political community is that a community that aspires to regulate itself. Um, um, it's not only a community that wants to, you know, realize a conception of the good. The family, in part, is that. But the family is not a community that aspires to regulate itself. Polit the, community, the, community, the political community is a community that aspires to regulate itself. So, sort of the intrinsic value and the, so the, the, the intrinsic and specific value of a political community is precisely the ability to change incrementally in the direction of the values it wants to serve that are in part the satisfaction of different conceptions of well-being. So um, you need something uh, that provides uh, you know, stability to the organism that uh, we think instrumental to realize goods that are for us. And at the same time, we cannot reduce that value to the values to value individual values. That's the idea of organic change. And I think it's, it's a specific of the political community. Other, other communities, friendship and family, are different. They, have, they serve different values. Going back to your, to your proposal yesterday, I think you, know, you could think that the European Union is that kind of community. It's a community that wants to change organically. Uh, why so? Well, because it thought that uh, it may be better for everybody involved to have s such a kind of community. Now, the European community doesn't require to be to provide uh, um, binding reasons for action uh, to be equally concerned about the well-being of everybody. That's is, is a transpolation. Dworkin, I think Dworkin makes a transpolation because he was really arguing about the importance of integrity, not about political theory. And, and you know, the question of uh, the puzzle of, uh, of Roberto, um, it, it, I mean, the inspiration of the paper is Argentina. And I think uh, the example still captures uh, what I wanted to say uh, and what I think it's, imp it's important for the Argentinian law to be binding. We, it doesn't seem that we're actually and I think it is, this is true in every society we know of, we are actually interested in everybody's well-being. Politics is, is not about that. In ideal community, maybe, and in a, in a better community than ours, too, but in the communities we know, people are not actually interested in everybody's well-being, everybody's uh, equal well-being. You're, you know, you're somehow interested in their well-being, but not as if it were your own. Um, and that seems to be, that fact seems to be the same in Argentina and in my hypothetical community. My, my hypothetical community captures the idea more vividly, so that's why I use it. But, but, but it's the same. Uh, and it seems just crazy to think that the fact that we are not equally interested in everybody's well-being <coughs> deprives our only instrument for organic change of, of, you know, bite. Marisa, you asked if I believe in a special morality. I believe in an independent morality. In morality as an independent system of norms, <coughs> independent from law, 
from religion, from prudence. When I, in 2012, read those brief pages on justice or hedges about the law, I believe that the tenet was too queer to be accepted by anyone. But I was wrong. And today we have uh, the Greenbergs and the Herr Hobbes doing their mischief. So you believe in special morality and you said, no, could be other part of morality and you don't see a problem. Well, as a matter of fact, I don't see the advantage and I can see the dangers of conflating law and morality. So I'm very careful about the thing. And I think, I really believe that we can better do jurisprudence with the law and morality deeply separated. And I feel a sense of stagnation in Anglo-Saxon jurisprudence when we are reduced to discuss and it's so strange at the conflating of law and morality. Maybe Anglo-Saxon jurisprudence needs something new. And I suggest uh, rereading of the German philosophers of the Republic of Weimar as a remedy. <coughs> Thank you, everyone. Thank you, speakers. Sí, Eduardo, tengo una pregunta para vos. Este, 